Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to today's online event at the Commonwealth Club of California. I am Laura Bazelon. I am a professor of law and the director of the Criminal Juvenile Justice and Racial Justice Clinics at the University of San Francisco, and I will be moderating the event today. I am excited to be joined by author, political strategist, and racial justice advocate Heather McGee to discuss her new book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Heather is the chair of the board for The Color of Change, a distinguished senior fellow at the progressive think tank Demos, and a regular media contributor. In The Sum of Us, Heather talks about how racism and a zero-sum mentality have been at the root of countless social problems and our reluctance to address them. The book includes stories of people from all backgrounds to buttress her argument that our country is breaking apart because of the entrenched and false belief that some must win, excuse me, that some must lose for others to win. Over the next hour, I'm going to talk to Heather about her literal, literal journey across America and her ideas about how to end the zero sum game with a new vision involving radical compassion. And I want to ask as many of your questions as I can. So if you are watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube and I will get to as many of them as I can later on. Thank you so much, Heather McGee, for joining us today. Laura, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be with you. I'm such a fan of your work, so I'm excited for this conversation. And, and thank you to Marcus Books uh, in Oakland for being the bookseller for today. And thank you to the Commonwealth Club, as always. It is 150% mutual. So <laughs> I wanted to start with one of the refrains of your book, and that is the refrain of the zero-sum game. And you mean something very specific. Can you walk us through what zero sum is when it comes to race and the fate of so many economic failures in the United States? Sure. I mean, I, I came at the journey that I took to write this book uh, from a place of, um, I'd say, frustration. Uh, frustration with nearly two decades working in public policy advocacy and law, trying to use research and lobbying, litigation, legislative drafting, advocacy to try to solve some of the big problems in the American economy. And uh, I, I ran for four years and helped build for nearly two decades before that. I think take focused on inequality. And, you know, we had some victories, but I have to say that, you know, as time went on, it became clearer and clearer that what I had learned in law and in economics was not explaining why we weren't solving these problems, why inequality was getting worse, why the country that invented the American dream was near the middle of the pack in, in our among our peer companies, countries and actually achieving it. And it was a sense of, I got to find other answers and look into different disciplines to figure out what's really going on, why we can't, as I say in the opening line of the book, have nice things. Um, like universal childcare and healthcare and paid family leave and a well-funded public school in every neighborhood. And so that led me to a whole different discipline um, of academics and research than I had really uh, been involved in earlier. And one of the first most compelling ideas that came uh, I came across in my research was this idea of the zero sum as a deeply uh, adopted narrative, a story that says that there's sort of a fixed pie of well-being and that progress for one group has to come at the expense of the other. A dollar more in my pocket must mean a dollar less in yours. And this was when I came across this uh, in the social science research, um, there were a bunch of studies showing that this was a very powerful idea, a way of seeing the world, a way of seeing American society and our economy, that it was a racialized idea that it's a racialized idea because the groups that are seen as competing are racial and ethnic groups. And it was a racialized idea because it was more commonly held, this zero-sum worldview, by white folks uh, than it was by folks of color. Generally speaking, we don't tend to believe that our progress has to come at white folks' expense. 
And when I learned that this zero sum mentality was uh, significant, depending on how you measure it, uh, you know, the plurality or majority of white Americans view the world this way, it helped me make sense of something that wasn't making sense with the economic tools. Because economically speaking, we know it's not a zero sum game, that in fact, inequality is bad for growth, that in fact, it's more like a, a regular game, right? That you want all of your best players on the field scoring points for your team, right? You don't want anyone sidelined due to debt, discrimination, and disadvantage. And so racial economic inequality costs the American economy, right? You had Citigroup coming out in 2020 calculating $16 trillion in lost GDP growth over the last 20 years due to the black-white economic divide. But once I realized that the sort of rational economic story of how we should all be able to prosper together uh, wasn't actually the, the dominant story for many Americans in the sort of political majority, um, it started to make a little more sense to me. I feel like just playing on this theme a little bit, when we think about a game, a zero-sum game, it's always implying that somebody's winning and somebody's losing, as you say. And of course, when you see these policies refracted through a racial lens, your argument really is that everybody loses, that essentially policies that poll well and garner majority white support lose popularity when white people think that they're not the only ones getting the benefit of this bargain and that somehow that means it loses value for them. And I'm wondering how you can explain that that mentality is actually not only costing communities of color, not only costing marginalized groups, but also costing white people, even though they don't realize it. You know, I mean, this is a this is a tricky concept because, you know, folks often talk about different groups voting against their interest. And for me, I come from an economics background. My work is in economic policy. And so I'm, I'm looking at pure material economic interest. There are other interests that are served by uh, feeling like you are denying another group something, uh, even if that means you're losing it yourself, right? And there's sort of psychological interests. There's things like uh, sort of your relative uh, value versus your absolute value, the feeling of knowing that you have higher status than another group that has been, uh, you know, for, for generations, uh, the sort of marketed as as the sort of bottom of a, a hierarchy of human value. So there are all of these other interests, and I want to acknowledge them. But speaking in terms of our economic performance as a society, of the fact that white Americans are part of an economy that simply has not been working for the majority of people over the past, what I call, you know, the inequality era over the last 40 to 50 years, I was able to really see material costs of racism for white people. Um, now, when I say everyone, uh, racism as a cost for everyone, I don't literally mean everyone because there is obviously a wealthy and self-interested elite that is uh, profiting quite well from our current uh, economic status quo of massive inequality, uh, self-interested elite that is actually selling these racist narratives around the zero sum. So it's sort of a, a, a um, an everyone uh, with, with a one uh, asterisk or distinction. But the point that I make throughout the book is that so many of our big economic problems that impact often the majority of white Americans um, even if it's disproportionately this economic problem impacting Americans of color, are ones where you can see the fingerprints of racism in our politics and our policymaking. And without racism in our politics and our policymaking, without um, this phenomenon I, I call drained pool politics, um, you actually would see a much more generous and economically thriving um, economic system in the U.S., you anticipated my next question. I want you to tell me about the drained pool. I want you to tell me about the literally drained pool and the figuratively drained pool. So this, my, my journey to write the sum of was an actual literal one. I took um, many, many trips across the U.S. over the course of three years from California to Mississippi to Maine and back again multiple times. And one of my earlier trips was to Montgomery, Alabama. And there I walked the grounds of what used to be a thousand plus person, lavishly funded public 
swimming pool. It was one of these grand resort style pools built in a building boom of public amenities and public goods during the 1930s and 40s. Things like, you know, schools and parks and libraries, roads and bridges. And yes, these swimming pools, which were really seen at the time as this sort of reflection of a commitment to the idea that it was government's right and responsibility to ensure a decent standard of living for her people. This was a sort of New Deal public goods ethos, and it was really born out of the lessons of the excesses of the first Gilded Age, which we've now surpassed in terms of inequality. It was born out of the crucible of the Great Depression. And that public goods ethos was reflected in things that are arguably more economically significant than swimming pools, things like social security for the elderly, like a massive investment in housing that workers could afford. And on top of that, something really heretofore uh, unprecedented, which was the idea of government playing a very heavy role in the subsidization and regulation of a mass home ownership vehicle, the the, the mortgage um, that would really create something we had never seen, which was middle class home ownership that workers could sort of pay off over time and have an appreciating asset, such an enormous part of the American dream and of our intergenerational wealth. Um, things like the New Deal commitment to collective bargaining, which was in many ways another public good that allowed the public to be able to bargain collectively for for more of the goods that they that they were creating and producing in the economy. Um, even the GI Bill, right, 1940s, uh, again another massive commitment to a decent standard of living for uh, the American people. And and really, this public goods sort of paradigm worked economically, right? That was when we created um, the largest middle class the world had ever seen, the highest standard of living in the world at the time, what we sort of think of today nostalgically on the left and the right as this sort of moment of, of real shared prosperity in the American dream. But virtually everything I just described uh, was either explicitly or in custom and practice uh, for whites only, segregated whether we're talking about very explicitly like in the housing market that created so much intergenerational wealth where the subsidies and the developments and the mortgage market was all based on a very racist assumption, never substantiated, that Black people would be too dear a credit risk to be able to be a part of the mortgage market. And so the federal government uh, forced the denial, as we know, uh, of loans in areas that were marked as Negro areas, uh, redlining, uh, required racial covenants, excluding uh, sales to Black families, in their subsidized housing, uh, you know, the, the subsidized private housing developments. Uh, the Social Security Act excluded the two job categories that most Black workers were in, right? Uh, domestic work and agricultural work uh, in a compromise with the Southern delegation to Congress. Uh, the GI Bill, race neutral on its face, but because the benefits were filtered through often racially segregated education and housing sectors, many, many Black GIs uh, were unable to avail themselves. Even the collective bargaining paradigm, when we had the American Federation of Labor allowing whites only unions and had a real sort of tradition of, of racially exclusive, both job discrimination and exclusion from uh, from labor, from bargaining units, uh, this whole sort of gift, right? This this massive uh, paradigm of free stuff, of largesse, uh, of taxpayer largesse to help create a thriving middle class largely excluded the Black people who contributed to it. And it wasn't until the civil rights movement when, in the wake of, Bo of Brown v. Board of Education, you really began to see courts begin to side with the claims that Black families were making, saying, you know what, it's our tax dollars that have been contributing to these public goods as well. And in the case of the public swimming pools, we want our kids to swim too. And that's when the desegregation orders became uh, started to roll in and in the case of the pools across the country, not just in the Jim Crow South, you had either with a whites only sign on the fence or just by custom enforced by intimidation and violence, a real segregated uh, system of public swimming pools. And the integration of public pools created a quiet crisis across the country. And many towns and cities um, decided to drain their public pools rather than integrate them. And so what does that mean, right? That means that they literally drained out the water and backed up truckloads of dirt. It means that a public good that was once 
kind of the prize of a community was destroyed. Uh, many towns sort of, you know, made them kept their pool, but sold them to the YMCA for a dollar so that they could still uh, be a private entity and they could be a private entity and therefore uh, continue to discriminate. In Montgomery, Alabama, where I walked the grounds where this thousand plus person pool used to be, they sold off the animals in the zoo. They shut down the entire Parks and Recreation Department of Montgomery for a decade until 1970, rather than integrate it. Um, And, you know, uh, for the lawyers uh, and the people who are interested in, in constitutional law in the room, in 1971, there was a court case where the Supreme Court already sort of wanting to be out of the business of enforcing integration and desegregation ruled uh, in a really just bizarrely uh, convoluted uh, case of convoluted logic that, in fact, there was no constitutional harm in a city uh, destroying a public good rather than integrating it. Uh, because as they said, you know, Negroes were hurt at just the same as whites. And really that idea that the zero sum logic born out to into the real world would allow for this drained pool phenomenon for a public good, including the kinds of public goods that helped to build the middle class, both literally and figuratively, uh, to be destroyed really is what we began to see in our politics. And for me, Laura, I, I, I grew up, you know, studying the economy in my career and really not having a compelling explanation for why the country that had like figured out the formula for widely shared prosperity turned their backs on that formula beginning really in the 1970s with the rise of neoliberal politics and economics with a, a really drastic turn away from government as a provider of uh, collective action solutions. Um, and this phenomenon of drain pool politics. And-